Fabrica. Welcome to this special Taino culture episode. I'm Priscilla Colon, co-founder and creative here at Casa Reito, where our mission is to promote the Taino language and culture. So a few weeks ago, the other co-founder of Casa Reito, my husband, was doing some research and he came across some misinformation on Taino female chiefs. So he urged me to create this video series. That's right. This is part one of a three-part series I do have to give a warning, if you're a parent out there and you have young children that tend to watch my videos, please watch these videos beforehand. We're going to be talking a lot about some topics that can be triggering, a lot of terrible things that happen throughout history, but I need to show this evidence so that we know the truth. So please pre-screen these videos before sharing them with your family. Now let's start by busting some myths. There is a huge debate online regarding female chiefs. Some people question if women were chiefs in Taino society before colonization. They say it was a Spanish invention to control women and Taino society. And they blame hardcore feminists for perpetuating this idea. So I gotta say right off the bat, do we really think these guys were for women's rights? So where did this debate begin? Well, it started with this quote from Ricardo Alegría. He said, There is no direct evidence that before the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors, there were women carrying out the functions of chiefs. It's possible that the Spanish imposed their hereditary concepts on the indigenous society and called the principal women of the Taino leaders Casica, aka female chief and that upon the chief's death, the Spanish then elevated his widow or principal wife to the office of chief. If you watched the video on decolonizing Taino, you know that Ricardo Alegría is right about one thing. The Spanish invented the female term casica. Cacique was originally a gender neutral term that could refer to both male and females. It doesn't mean that they invented the fact that women were chiefs. So, who was Ricardo Alegría and why did people listen to him? Ricardo Alegría is the father of modern Puerto Rican archaeology. He was an eminent scholar, archaeologist, and anthropologist, and he was the first director of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. He created the University of Puerto Rico's Archaeological Center of Investigation. So as you can see, he was a highly respected individual in Puerto Rican culture. However, he was also a man of his time. He directed the Institute in the 1950s or so, so you can imagine that he reflects the ideas of society at that moment. So, how do we know that maybe he wasn't right? Well, let's take a look at some evidence that I found. It comes from a January through March 1985 magazine issue of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. That is the same institute that he started. Now, in this magazine, the writer provides historical and contemporary evidence using information that Ricardo Alegría didn't have way back then. And this article proves that there were female chiefs before colonization. And it wasn't just in the Caribbean. So let's start with a question. Were female chiefs common? The answer is yes, especially in matrilineal societies. A matrilineal society is one where you trace your family through your maternal or mother's line. Many of these matrilineal societies were organized into clans, and clans were groups of related families. The husbands usually joined the wife's clan, and the children belonged to the mother's clan. And all of the clan leaders were the grandmothers because these were the eldest women of the clan. So again, it's the mother's line. That's what matrilineal means. So now let's take a look at what happened when there was a chief. Chiefs were chosen based on their matrilineal line, their mother's line. So if a woman's family, for example, was where the chief would come from, the next chiefs in line would be her children. First, if she had a son, then if she had a daughter. And if there were no sons, then the daughters would be chiefs. Sometimes if the son died or passed on or could no longer be chief, it would then go to the daughter. And if that didn't happen, then it would go to his nieces and nephews. 
Why? Because the nieces and nephews are on the mother's line. Why would none of the son's kids be the next chief? Because the children belong to the mother's clan, and the mother probably was not part of that same family. This created an interesting dynamic between aunts and uncles and their nieces and nephews. So for example, if the uncle was the chief, he would then train the nephew to be the next chief if he had one. It was like having a more of a father-son relationship. And again, it's because he's teaching his nephews the way that the clan works, his mother's clan. Now, let's tackle that first argument that somehow the Spanish created female chiefs in the Caribbean when they came. Well, we're gonna find evidence that there were female leaders, chiefs, advisors, and so many others all over Turtle Island or the Americas. Let's start with the female leaders of North America. If we take a look at oral traditions of the Seneca and Tuscarora, you're going to find that the first chief was a woman called Godasiyu. According to oral traditions, the tribes started quarreling amongst each other, and sometimes in the stories she either left or was killed by accident. But when this happened, the tribes started speaking other languages and they could no longer communicate, which means that they broke apart. But that was oral tradition. What was life like for these indigenous women? Well, women led the clans as clan mothers. They organized and coordinated work for the clan. This is very similar to what the cacique or chief did in Taino tribes. Moreover, women were the sole owners of the land and the homes. And throughout history, there have been highly regarded female chiefs, such as Queen Alakipa. Queen Alakipa was so highly respected among her people and even the new colonizers that the French, British, and even George Washington himself went to meet with her personally, bringing gifts. They all tried to bring her into an alliance with them during all of the different wars that they had. Now, the Seneca and Tuscarora tribes that I just described are part of a larger League of Nations. They're called the Haudenosaunee, or the people of the Longhouse. You may have heard of them referred to as the Iroquois, or Six Nations. These are the tribes that originally broke up when their female chief died. Hundreds of years later, they came back and they formed the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, that is a League of Six Nations. And when they formed this new government, women of course had a say in it. They continued leading as clan mothers, and the clan mothers chose a male chief to represent them at the confederacy. The clan mothers established the agenda and terms for negotiation. Women were consulted on all major decisions such as war, and if a chief didn't meet his duties, they recalled and replaced him. These clan mothers not only had participation in government, they really were the heart and soul of the government. And actually, U.S. democracy was based on the Confederacy. They took all of these ideas, except for the rights of women, which is a major component of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Moreover, the indigenous women of this Confederacy inspired the suffragist movement, which led to the women's right to vote in 1919. It was not hardcore feminists who influenced indigenous women. It was the other way around. So before colonization, were there female leaders in South America? Let's take a look. In Northern Colombia, there's an indigenous group called Senu, and it's divided into three subgroups. Let's see what the historical evidence shows. The Fincenu's principal town was governed by a female chief and her husband and she was more respected than the chiefs of the other Senu regions. So what was actually happening here? Well, there were three siblings who were in charge of three areas. One of them was a woman and two of them were men. But the female chief was the most powerful and she was chief before contact. In the Carrapa indigenous group, if a male chief doesn't have any children, then his wife can become chief. But when she dies, it's her late husband's sister's kids, that is, his nieces and nephews. First male, then female, who can become chief. Was it just the areas of modern-day Colombia, or did it also happen in other areas? Let's take a look at modern-day Venezuela. 
The Yaruro and Guajiro are indigenous groups in the yellow area of this map. They were originally two tribes that split up, and they followed the matrilineal line when electing a chief. However, a person's characteristics are also taken into account. Now let's take a look at more evidence that came before colonization. Let's start with some chronicles. This was written by Father Francisco de Villacorta around 1533. He says, And the Indians answered that they are from Guanacoa Valley and that they are under the female chief Yacoaraita. So to give you some background information, Chief Yacoaraita's area is literally facing the Caribbean. The priest in question was sent ahead of all of the military to warn any indigenous groups that he encountered that they had to ally themselves with the Spanish, aka become their slaves and pay tribute, or else they would be killed. And this female chief was one of 22 chiefs in the region. The rest were male. However, she's the only one who stood up against the Spanish and decided not to become their slaves and fought them the entire time. We hear about Chief Orokomai around the time of 1544. She was from the area of Palenque and she declared war on the Spanish. Her fighters also defended other tribes against the Spanish. And she was such a fierce chief that she was dubbed the Queen of the Amazons by the Spanish, who obviously feared her and her fighters. There was also Chief Magdalena. We hear about her in 1640. She was also Palenque and she continued fighting the Spanish. She had the city of San Juan de la Laguna destroyed. That is a hundred years later and the female chiefs are still fighting against the Spanish. Now let's talk about the female leaders of the Caribbean. We're going to first look at what the chronicles tell us. Pedro Martir de Anglerías writes, Among them was a woman whose orders the others followed as if she were queen, as far as we could surmise, and she was accompanied by her son. Now, before we get into the background of this story, I have to give you the first trigger warning. This is a very hard story to hear, but it is the very first encounter with a female cacique of the Caribbean. So if you have young children, make sure you watch this beforehand because it may not be suitable for them. This quote refers to something that happened just a few days before Christopher Columbus landed on Boriquen, Puerto Rico. The woman who's being talked about was actually a cacique of I.I., that is modern-day St. Croix. This happened in 1493, when a canoe cut in front of the Spanish ship. The Spanish decided that these people were quote-unquote cannibals, that they needed to be attacked and killed, and they began their attack on this small canoe. This canoe had the cacique, her son, and several men, and of course, they defended themselves. During the attack, she killed another Spaniard. The Spanish took her onto their ship, had her raped repeatedly, and then sent her off to Spain to be sold as a slave. And that is the horrific story of the first time we ever hear of a female Taino chief. Now, I know that is a terrible story. I can't say that they get any better. We have a really horrible history, but at the same time, we need to understand it in order to know where we come from. So next time, we're going to continue with Taino female chiefs. We're going to learn about all of them, not just one or two. And of course, we're going to talk about one of the most famous ones, Ana Kaona. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I know some of these stories are really hard to hear, but the more we understand our history, the more we're going to be able to understand ourselves. And the truth is, because of these female leaders, because of our mothers, we are here and we need to share the stories so that we don't forget them. In the meantime, taikaraya guaitiao nagu.